We're going to get into Psalm 22 this morning. I've had a couple people go, what about Psalm 22? We're in a Psalm series. How about chapter 22? So today is the day. We're going to get into it. But first, let's definitely turn to God and I just think, try to get our head together. Father, we're grateful that we have good reason for looking to your son to rescue us. That we're not just making up bedtime stories to help us face life, but we have great, great confidence based on what we've seen revealed in the Bible that Jesus is the one. And so I thank you for that, and I just pray that would really just come home in a deeper way as we go through this today. Amen. All right, Psalm 22. Now, if you've kind of watched Christianity from a distance and observed Christians, you've probably noticed they make a huge deal out of the crucifixion. Like if you go into some, uh, some big old churches, usually front and center, maybe close to the altar, there's a statue of the crucified Christ you know, just really placed in a prominent location. You also see this symbol all over the place, not just in churches, tattoos, earrings. This is probably the best known symbol in human history, and it's a symbol of how Jesus was crucified by the Romans and how he died in this, this gruesome, horrible way. It's a weird thing to be such a, such a huge emphasis, and yet it is. And I want to get at, why is that? Why is the crucifixion so important? And here's something that you may find striking. And that is, the answer to this question is in Psalm 22. It's in the chapter that we're going to study. Now, you would think it would be in the New Testament, you know, an explanation of, of why the crucifixion matters. That would make sense because the New Testament was written after Jesus died and rose again, but I'm arguing that the answer to why the crucifixion matters is in Psalm 22, not just a detailed description of what happened, but also an explanation of why it matters, all in Psalm 22, all written a thousand years before Jesus ever lived. I I think that's a pretty remarkable claim. You know, to defend that claim, I mean, think about it. If it's true that this ancient document that predates Jesus by a thousand years is about him, one, that means he's special. That he's not just some religious teacher, but, but some supernatural power foresaw how he would die. It also means, you know, our sense that, that we go to him and look to him for salvation, to rescue us. That God sent him to us. It would be more credible if we have this supernatural book telling us to look for him and to, and, and to look for how he fulfilled all these details. And so this, there's a lot at stake. The other thing that would be at stake here is it would point to the fact that when Jesus was crucified, he wasn't caught off guard, but that he knew it was, it was part of, Jesus, of God's plan. And so I want to get into defending this. And to do it, I'm going to start with the crucifixion and then back up into Psalm 22. Okay, so let's read. This is when Jesus is in agony. He's on the cross. We read in Matthew that about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I, I don't know if that's how it sounds, but that's how I say it. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, so back in the day when people heard this Eli, Eli, their first reaction was, he must be calling out to Elijah, the prophet. You even can read some of those who were standing there when they heard this began saying, oh, Jesus is calling for Elijah. Uh, Turns out, no, he wasn't. This part is Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic is his native language. And we get the translation of that Aramaic phrase in the next couple lines. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus, he wasn't calling for Elijah the prophet. He was calling out to God. And that's led people more recently to ask, well, maybe he was confused. You know, Jesus uh, was aware he was 
God's Messiah. Maybe when he was rejected by the Jews and killed by the Romans or, you know, up on this cross, maybe as he's hanging there, surveying everything, he was like, well, holy crap, God, what's going on here? This is not plan A. I didn't think this was going to happen. A lot of, that's how a lot of people take these words. But that doesn't really work because we know during Jesus' ministry, he was fully aware he was going to suffer a painful death. We know that from a lot of passages. Here's a great example. Here's Jesus beginning to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise from the dead. So he, this is early on in his ministry. He was very aware that he was going to die a difficult death. He was so aware of it, he actually went to the Father and said, Father, is there any way this can be avoided? And, and God said, no. And Jesus said, okay, your will be done. So Jesus went into the cross with his eyes wide open. And if you think about this, if he wasn't calling for Elijah, and if he wasn't confused, then what, what was he doing when he called out, my God, my God? Why have you forsaken me? And, and what he was doing, just look at those, those last two lines carefully. What he was doing was quoting Psalm 22 verbatim. Okay, Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's right. This is, this is, this is what it means. And so, if you're following, if you're tracking with me so far, I'm arguing that far from being caught off guard by being crucified, Jesus was not just aware he was going to suffer and die, but he was, he was telling everybody who was witnessing what was happening, go to Psalm 22, because it's a description, a detailed description of what I'm about to go through, what, what I am going through. I'm going to argue in this teaching, if you... If you ask that question of why would Jesus quote Psalm 22, two reasons. One is to show that his crucifixion was predicted in advance. The first 21 verses of this passage are a very detailed blow-by-blow -blow description of what it looked like through Jesus' eyes to be crucified. But not just that. Another reason why he quoted Psalm 22 is to help us appreciate why his crucifixion would go on to be important. This is in the last 10 verses of, of this chapter. A lot of people assume, well, Jesus just quoted verse 1. I'll argue uh, later in this teaching that as he hung there bleeding to death on the cross, he, he quoted all 31 verses. So let's, uh, let's, let's try to support this first claim that Jesus' suffering on the cross was predicted in advance. Okay, so let's start again in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Okay, so right away, we have an important question to answer. And that is, why wouldn't we just assume this is about David? I mean, what's the title of the psalm? It's a psalm of David. It's written in the first person. It's describing so far, I mean, David suffered. This could be a description of, of the kind of sufferings he went through. Why wouldn't we just assume this is all about David? Well, here's why. As I go through this, as we go through the rest of the chapter together, we're going to run into several details that do not fit David's life. It'll, be, it'll become evident. This is about somebody, but not about David. This is not autobiographical. It's pointing forward to someone else. And I'll, make that, I'll, I'll point those, those details out as we go through. Now, right off the bat, I, uh, I just want to say I picked this title, The View from the Cross, because like I mentioned, Psalm 22 is the crucifixion from Jesus' perspective. Think about a, like a doorbell camera 
You know, you've got your smartphone, you're looking at your front porch, and you see these thieves come up and take a Christmas package off your porch. The doorbell camera in this scene is Jesus' eyes. And what we're seeing through his eyes is these people moving against him to crucify him. And it's very vivid, very detailed, very, uh, very similar, not just similar, identical to what the Gospels say Jesus went through on the cross. Even here, I mean, just at the beginning, you can see this person's in anguish, and they're, they're fatigued, they can't get any rest. If we keep reading, it says, I'm a worm and not a man, uh, a reproach of men, despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. And so this, this person at some point in the past apparently claimed that God delights in me. We know that was the case with Jesus. God, God said, this is the one in whom I'm well pleased. And yet when, in, when things are rough in the moment of his uh, of his need when he's, he's dying, his, his enemies are mocking him. In this case, they're saying, oh, God delights in you? Well, let him rescue you. Let him deliver you. And if you read back in Matthew, Jesus' enemies used identical language. They were like, Jesus saved others, but he can't save himself. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. So it's clearly an echo, the very almost identical language that, that we see back in Psalm 22. He goes on, yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You've been my God from my mother's womb. Now right here, this is one of these details that doesn't fit David's life. This guy, whoever he is, was trusting God on his mother's breasts. That's not a good fit for David. Uh, here's one place, for example, where David says, I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. That's really different than what we have here where it says, you've been my God from my mother's womb. There's, that's a huge difference. This is the first of many indications that this is somebody other than David that's being described here. Be not far from me, he says, for trouble is near. For there's no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. You could assume, well, maybe like David was out in the wilderness and he ran into some wild animals or something like that. No, uh, the bulls of Bashan here, if you keep reading down through the passage, these are, these are called evildoers. You know, animals don't really, they're amoral. These are people, hostile human enemies that have encircled uh, this, the person that's speaking here. It says, They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength's dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me, he says, in the dust of death. This is, whatever this is, this is a tremendous duress he's under. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. You know, I, I look at this and you, you think a lot of what David ran into when he was in a, a tight spot was some kind of military battle. But whoever this is does not have a weapon, right? This person, uh, he, he's not wearing armor. He's stripped naked. He's not in some kind of battle scene. This is really an execution. That's why if you look in the bottom left there in verse uh, 15, it says, you lay me in the dust of death. This person is dying. And that again, this is another thing that doesn't fit when you, when you look at David's life. This isn't how he faced death. When David died, he was sleeping next to a beautiful young woman to keep him warm in bed. That was how the end of his life went. <laughs> and then he was eventually buried with his fathers and given a king's burial. So this, 
This is really a bad fit for David who died in peace. What this is a perfect fit for, it really is. It's a perfect fit for how Jesus died. And let me, let me make that case by continuing to go through these details. And to do this, uh, as I go through, what I'd like to do is, is refer a couple times at least to an article that was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was written by a uh, cardiac pathologist named William Edwards from the Mayo Clinic. And the whole paper is about how, our, how bodies, how a human body would be affected by going through the crucifixion. And I think his description of how we would handle an event like that, how a body would handle that, helps heighten how accurate this, predict, this, this description of the cross is. Like, for instance, it says, I'm poured out like water, and further down, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Okay, this is clearly, he's taught, you know, being spent, you know, having your strength sapped. That's a description of physical exhaustion. And if you read Edwards, he points out that, you know, if you're on a cross and you're pushing yourself up from your feet and pulling yourself up from your wrists to try to get a breath, and you're doing that over and over again, and it's excruciating, it would be incredibly exhausting. He says every respiratory effort would become agonizing and lead eventually to asphyxiation. That's, that's, that's very similar to what he's describing here, just being completely spent until he couldn't move anymore. He says, my bones are out of joint. So just, just picture a crucifixion victim. You know, ligaments and, and tendons stretched until they snapped and then dislocation. That's a, that's a very clear description of uh, dislocated limbs. My heart, he says, is like wax and it's melted within me. You could take this to be, I was sad, like my emotional state was not good. Uh, but the whole context all the way through here is talking about physical suffering. Better to take this as severe heart trauma. And Edwards, and I'm summarizing as kind of a, yes, a summary of, of what he says in this article. He points out that blood loss and oxygen deprivation would lead to congestive heart failure and sometimes accumulating fluid around the heart and lungs. So maybe you've read, it says in the Gospels, that a Roman soldier plunged a spear into Jesus' side, and that all this blood and fluid leaked out. This would be an explanation, because he was, his, his heart was like wax. He was, he was going through this tremendous trauma. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. That's a, a great picture of dehydration. And then he says, I can count my bones and they look and stare at me. If you're familiar with Roman crucifixion, actually not too long ago, just recently, in England, they found a crucifixion victim. And they dug up the grave. They actually found a nail driven through the victim's heel bone. You can read about this in Smithsonian. And uh, it was real common back then because guards would get impatient to smash the bones of the victim. Here, this doesn't really say much about what, are the bones broken or not, but this, this description of he's up there buck naked, humiliated by his captors, we know from many accounts that that's exactly what crucifixion victims were subjected to. Lots of details here that really are a good fit. You think about this, this final one. This is very significant. They pierced my hands and my feet. Why does this matter so much? Because crucifixion is the only form of execution around this time that had anything to do with puncturing your, your hands and your feet. It makes it unique to crucifixion. We can look at a lot of different execution methods. Nothing fits that description. And so you take all this in, you can see why somebody would be like, wow, that is very, very much like what Jesus went through. So much so that uh, some, some have argued a different way to translate this line in bold here is like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet, which would completely change the character of, of this whole passage. The problem with this translation is that phrase in italics, they are at, 
That's not in any manuscript that we have of this passage. It's not in the Masoretic text. It's not in the Septuagint. It's not in anything that we have. And so, yeah, none of our manuscripts contain that phrase. And if you take out, they are at, what are you left with? You're left with, like a lion, my hands, my feet, which doesn't make a lot of sense. The oldest Jewish translation of this passage that we have, and it predates Christ, and our oldest Hebrew manuscript of this passage, both read, they pierced. And so when I, you know, as we just kind of walk through what we've looked at here, what kind of experience is this? Well, he's physically exhausted with dislocated limbs and heart trauma, dehydrated, stripped naked, and his hands and feet are pierced. That's pretty compelling. That level of detail, you realize, I don't know, if you were going to try to describe crucifixion, it'd be hard to do much better than this. You know, the most common form of execution at this time was stoning. That was how the Jews executed people during the time of David. But that's a sudden death. This is very gradual. You know, what we're reading about here plays out slowly. And so uh, these details, and I, I just want to mention one more just to point out something that's true. You may think it's preposterous that an ancient, uh, an ancient document like Psalm 22 would actually predict what happened in the future a thousand years later. But this passage is one of dozens of passages in the Old Testament that, that see the future before it happens and see it in great detail. And detail is a unique feature of a lot of these predictions. Like this detail, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. If you're familiar with the gospel story, Jesus was to mock him, dressed in this huge robe, this really beautiful piece of cloth. And when the soldiers took it off of his body, instead of ripping it into four pieces, they gambled so that the winner could take the whole thing intact. So this, this little detail also, and many other details we could get into, perfectly fit what happened. Now, of course... If it's that good, some, it would provoke a response, and it has. One alternate explanation. Like if you were going to try to explain this away, what would you say? Well, one would be maybe the gospel writers, maybe these guys just, you know, they're fiction writers. They describe their Messiah this way, so it perfectly fits Psalm 22. What's the problem with that? The problem is that we have an ancient Roman historian who has an account, a guy named Tacitus in, in his book, Annals, where he describes how a guy named Crestus suffered the extreme penalty of crucifixion under the hands of Pontius Pilate. So we have a source outside the Bible that actually corroborates the fact that Jesus was crucified. So this key detail about Jesus' life is not something that they just made up. Another possibility would be that Jesus orchestrated these events to fulfill the prediction. The problem with that, a couple problems. One, you'd have to be able to pick the moment in history when this was the preferred method of execution to be born. Difficult to do. And you'd have to want to fulfill this prediction and die for no good reason in the worst way possible. Pretty unlikely. I just don't see that. That doesn't seem plausible to me. Maybe Christians modified Psalm 22 to fit the details of his life. No. We have, we have the Septuagint that predates Jesus. This part of it predates Jesus by centuries, and it reads just like the Bible in your hands, or I guess the Bible these days on your phone, whatever. But yeah, so there you go. I think the better explanation is that when Jesus was on the cross calling people's attention to this, he knew he was fulfilling Psalm 22. And if that's true, he was special. If that's true, the claim that maybe God sent him to rescue us is a lot more credible. If that's, if that's really true, he was not confused as he was crucified. In fact, he knew that this was part of God's plan all along. You know, and, and if all that's true, maybe instead of asking, how could this passage possibly make this prediction accurately? 
Maybe we should ask, why did God do this to Jesus? I don't know if you've noticed, but as we went through uh, Psalm 22, God is the one kind of behind the scenes making things happen. It says, God, you lay me in the dust of death. And if you read other parts of the Bible that describe this, you can tell that God had a hand in Jesus being crucified. You know, another passage that talks about this, you'd think, well, to answer this question, why did this have to happen? You'd have to go to the New Testament? No. In fact, there's another passage in the Old Testament written centuries before Jesus lived that explains why God had Jesus die. Uh, I'm just going to give you some clips from it. Here it says on Isaiah 53, this is uh, probably written about 720 B.C. Uh, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity or the sin of all of us to fall on him. Now, what he's describing here is a concept called substitutionary atonement. It's the idea, and this, this goes back to the temple and animal sacrifices. The Jews would take an animal, a, 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 ble- a blemishless animal, and offer it as a sacrifice, as a substitute on their behalf to be an atonement or a covering for sin. And this person, not an animal, but a human being, is offering his own life as a substitute for the people as an atonement, as a way of taking sin and its punishment off of them and onto himself. That's exactly what this is saying. The Lord, and it's God that's involved in this, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. This person, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he'll see his offspring and prolong his days. There's even the hint there that after this death, he'll see life again. As a result of the anguish of his soul, my servant will justify the many as he bears their iniquities. This is very clear. A human being that God has sent will offer himself as a substitute, will offer his life so that we can benefit, so that the judgment we deserve, that, that we're walking around weighing down on our shoulders, he can take that off of us and put all that weight on himself as our substitute. That's what this is describing. And so here, you've, I think, heard a fair amount. Why is Jesus' crucifixion so important? Well, this is a big reason why. Because his death what happened there, there was some kind of transaction where sin that we deserve to be punished for was put on Christ. And not only that, how Jesus died and why it mattered was predicted in the Old Testament centuries before he lived. And so as you're thinking about just the significance of Jesus being this offering for you, and as other people have thought, I mean, it's... If you let it really hit you, it does require a response. This is a pastor of a really large church, a well-respected pastor, Lewis. I think he, he pronounces his name Lapides. He's, uh, he grew up in a Jewish family, had heard people claim that Jesus was Messiah, decided to read the Old Testament all the way through. You can read about his story in this awesome, that's a great book, by the way lays out his story. And when, when Louis Lapides got to Isaiah 53, he was like, wow, I know this document predates Christ. This is exactly what Christians say about why Christ died. And that, that caused a, a shift in his heart. He decided to embrace Christ as his Messiah. And so as you're considering what to do with this info, I just wanted, I want to make one thing really clear. Our natural tendency, and this is, this is just our natural human tendency, is going to always be to try to approach God 
by pointing to what we're doing, to, to our good behavior or to the fact that we're stepping away from things that are bad. We're always going to naturally want to do that. But if you're understanding this, everything we've talked about, we need to instead completely lean into and depend on what Christ did for us. That's the only way. I went uh, whitewater rafting years ago, which I will never, ever do again. <laughs> totally terrifying. And I, I, I like, I've, I've tried to surf, I've, you know, I've done a lot, you know. I would bungee jump if I had the time, I'd do that, but I'll never do whitewater rafting. Anyhow, my guide uh, was telling our group before we got in the water, hey, if the boat dips down into a, like a low point in the river, and all I could picture is just being in the spin cycle of a washing machine and just drowning. But he was like, don't cling to the boat. Your reflex will be to try to grab the raft. He was like, lean down toward the water with your paddle, and as you push down in the water, it will push you back into the raft. Counterintuitive, he, was, he said, but that will save you. And this is counterintuitive. I know we want to cling to what we've done right, but that will not work. You have to lean into what Christ has done because it's fully adequate. He took it all on himself. He'll receive you as is, without any conditions, if you just look to him and appeal to him to make your forgiveness possible because of what he did on the cross. Really crucial. Now, I said that Psalm 22 also talks about why Jesus' crucifixion is so important. Check this out. This is, pretty, this is the part of this, this uh, chapter nobody ever talks about. And I think it's just as cool. At the end of verse 21, after going through this terrible ordeal and, and, and dying, being laid in the dust of death, the crucified person in Psalm 22 says, you rescued me. And so, from that point forward, starting in 22 to the end of the chapter, there's a complete tone shift. Instead of these desperate pleas, God, help me, help me, help me. Instead of that, we have him confidently saying, I'm going to tell of your name, God, to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I'm going to praise you. So he's reflecting on the fact that he was delivered through this horrific experience that God lifted him up again. And then he goes on and he turns. He's, he's saying this in the, in the presence of other people. And so he exhorts his listeners. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of, the, of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. And so he's saying, look, something awe-inspiring has happened to me. In this deliverance, in God rescuing me from crucifixion, death, and then lifting me up again. He's like, you should praise God. And the, implica the, the implication is very clear. You, there's something you've benefited from and what I've been through. Something, something awe-inspiring. God has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. So he's just like, Lord, I thank you for, for stepping forward and getting me through this. He goes on, he says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before you. Okay, so here's, here's another answer to why did the crucifixion matter. As this, as this crucified one looks back on what happens, he realizes people are going to remember what happened here with me. And they're going to turn to you. Look at this. I mean, that's, it's not just Jews either. The scope of this goes way beyond national Israel, way beyond anything that happened in David's life. This is another detail that doesn't fit David. What happened with this individual benefits everyone in the world. That's what he's saying. All these nations, when they turn to you after remembering the cross, you know, they'll be changed. And so this, yeah, that's, that is, there's this expanding impact from what happened through this person's suffering. He says, the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who can't keep his soul alive. And so he's just, he's just saying, and we know it, that we're dust, that we're mortal, 
that we can't keep our, we can't even keep ourselves alive. But what we can do is we can recognize what happened on the cross and we can turn to God. And David predicts that many, many people will. If you read the last two verses, and I'm switching over to the NIV here because I, I like the way that, that translation renders this. He says, posterity. That, that just means it's a fancy word for future generations. Future generations will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They'll proclaim his righteousness to a people unborn, for he has done it. And so not only does this predict that all these people will remember what happened and they'll turn to the Lord, he says that that, that announcement of what happened will be passed from one generation to the next until the whole world is reached. And I'll tell you, that is exactly what we've seen. You know, this message started to go out of, of Jesus' crucifixion, making our salvation possible because he's our substitute. That, that started going out when the church began, and it continued to go out. It's going out today, and one day that job will get done. This message will get out to virtually the entire planet. And that's cool. That's why the crucifixion matters, and that's right out of Psalm 22. And then there's this final statement he makes. Verse 31, the last thing, he has done it. Does that ring a bell? That sounds very similar to it is finished. You know, it's just, you, know, you survey everything that's happened, and it is this amazing thing, and yeah, at the very end of the psalm, Jesus' final words on the cross, it is finished. That's why we think it's very likely he quoted this entire thing. So imagine you're, you're Satan, right? And you're excited. You could finally, you could move and, and operate so that God's Messiah is crucified. And then you're, you're there at the foot of the cross watching this all unfold. And as Jesus is up there, he starts to quote line by line through Psalm 22. And Satan starts to realize, oh, oh, oh what? I know that passage. And then he starts rifling through everything in there, matching the details up with what he's seeing. And then realizing the impact of what he's just done. Pretty cool. God's a good card player. He knows how to keep his cards close to his chest. Pretty sneaky. All right, a couple uh, questions to ask just to, to reflect on what to do with this. One is, well, what about it? Was Jesus more than a wise teacher? People really balk at this. People don't like the idea of thinking of Jesus as any, any other than a, one of a long line of religious teachers that have come and gone. The idea that he was something more than that, that he was unique, that, that puts people off, but it doesn't really fit because he did things that were incredibly unique. After he was crucified and rose, he had a little Bible study with his disciples. And in this Bible study, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yeah, it was written long ago that the Messiah, that's, that's me, would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. And then listen to this language. It was also written that his message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there's forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You think Jesus took them through Psalm 22? I do. I think he took them through Isaiah 53 and a lot of other amazing passages we can't get into right now. And so you realize, I mean, what other religious leader was able to point to an ancient body of literature filled with detailed predictions about his life. I mean, if I told you, hey, I, I found a newspaper in my attic from 1920, and the front page story was all about me, you'd be like, dude, I mean, hey, let's, let's take a walk and, you know, maybe go over to the hospital or something. <laughs> you'd be worried about me, and Jesus is doing no less than this. This is like seeing yourself in Shakespeare. We take this for granted. This is special. There's nobody like this but Jesus. And so you've got you to ask yourself, is it possible 
that because God loves you and because he's wanted to reach you and he's wanted to help you identify who his true dude is, his savior that he sent for you, that he's done something special to make Jesus different from all the rest. I know it's hard to trust people that claim to be God, (laughs) that claim to be Messiah, but Jesus makes one hell of a claim, and he can back it up. That's something to think about. Now, what about this, too? Are you telling people why Jesus' crucifixion matters? A lot of us, we're persuaded. Hey, I, I know that I benefited from Jesus' death on the cross, But you know how it is. You can get excited about something, and then over time, that can wane. It can just be just an assumed thing. And we get to the point where it's just just not the thing that we're talking about. You know, honestly, what I've been talking about a lot lately is Dune. Have you guys seen Dune yet? Well, it's way better than the David Lynch uh, sting version of Dune. I saw it just on Monday with my daughter, and I thought it was awesome. I thought that movie was fantastic. I've been telling everybody I see, have you seen this movie? You should go see it. And that's the way it is. We, we find something valuable if it's a good restaurant or a flavor of ice cream. We're like, oh, you've got to try this. Well, what about what we have in the crucifixion? Have you reflected on how incredible it is? You know, this, the whole point of the end of Psalm 22 is that this is such a good thing, such a praiseworthy thing, that it ought to get out there. Jesus, he, his vision was for it to get out there. The good news about the kingdom he, he predicts, just like Psalm 22, it will be preached throughout the whole world so that the nations will hear it. This was his vision for this message. And uh, it's worth getting out there. I mean, think, I'm not going to put a grisly picture of the cross up here. But our God, Jesus, the Messiah, came into this world as a man. Not just a man, but what did he say in Psalm 22, verse 6? He came as a worm, uh, somebody despised. And not just despised, somebody who knelt down and washed the disciples' feet like he was their slaves. Somebody who offered his life on the cross, and stepped up and said, I'll take it. I will take that weight of sin off of people I love and take it onto myself. You just think about, what kind of God does this? What kind of God lays himself out like this and makes such as just a wonderful change of fortunes possible for people that really deserve to be far from God, to be able to bring us near? That's every Christian story in this room. That's That is way better than Dune, right? Way better than the new cell phone you just got. Way better than the the lawnmower you just purchased, whatever it is. That is worth talking about. And so I just ask, are you still excited? Do you still still realize, like Jesus does at the end of the psalm, just what a praiseworthy, amazing thing that needs to be shared the cross of Christ is? I just, I hope that's the case. Maybe there's some people specifically you can think about that don't know about this, that you can share this with, because this is something worth talking about. So, okay.